dad. He was uh, born right up the road here. And uh, my mom was born a mile north. And uh, well, eventually they got together and they got married. And uh, they had six children, three boys and three girls. My mom, I remember my mom real well. She was born on, uh, on the Birnbahn farm. Uh, she had one sister and one brother. And uh, my mom was the eldest. And she had to go work out by the neighbors when she was like 14 years old. Milk cows and big bread in a big outdoor oven like they had. They always had a lot of hired men working there, so there was a lot of bread to be big. And she worked there for, I think, a dollar a week. And uh, I don't know exactly how old she was when she went to work for a lady in Chicago. Can you imagine back in them days, you, you got a job in Chicago? She worked for uh, Mrs. Ross. That was the lady's name, Mrs. Ross. She worked there until, well, I would say it, until she got married. And uh, she was really a hard-working woman. She was always up first in the morning and start the fires in the, in the kitchen. And she always had a lot of chickens. Oh, when she went to work by Mrs. Ross, she got three dollars a week. Uh, and that lady was always busy. At night, when we'd be done with our homework and uh, reading the papers and stuff like that, she was uh, either knitting or crocheting or she uh, cut uh, pieces to make blankets and make carpet rags. She made enough carpet rags. They had made carpeting for for our stairways up in the house and in the hallways. And then, then she would make uh, uh, dried apples. You know, in the winter time, you peel them and cut them in, in slices and uh, put them in the bake oven to dry them for a couple of days. And then in the winter time, they would take them and uh, make some apple flute. <laughs> That's looks of her name for it. And they always made, uh, <clears throat> processed all their, their meat butcher. Uh, uh, she always made the best moose trapping that I've ever eaten. Uh, and she always had a garden and lots of chickens. Uh, yeah, she was really a good mom. She made our school clothes. She made my, my pants and my shirt when I went to school. And she even made, uh, I know when my sister Jenny, uh, she graduated from eighth grade, and that's when they started high school in Decatur, two years, and she wanted to go to high school, but uh, my folks couldn't afford it. But she was so determined that in the morning she went and got and sat in the car and she rode along. She went to high school. And then when winter came, well, she needed uh, to start wearing snow pants. My mom made her snow pants, you know, from some coats, you know. She was really handy making all that stuff. Yeah. Oh, my dad, he was a very kind man. He liked carpentry the best. He was a, a carpenter. He built a lot of houses. Um, in them days you worked 
uh, under your parents' rule until you were 18 years old. So he worked on a farm a mile from his home place. There was a big farmer there. He worked there till he was 18. Then he went to work in Milwaukee. He worked in a, in a pattern shop. And he worked for a streetcar company for a while. And then he learned the carpenter trade. And he started up his carpenter business. At one time he had 12 men working for him. And uh, oh, I, I think around 19, oh, the first years of 1900, he came home from Milwaukee and he built a, a new house for his parents. It's right up the road here. And then he built a lot of other homes around here and barns. And, uh, well, he also liked farming, you know, on a small scale. Uh, and he raised pigs. His favorite cows were black and white Holsteins, but he preferred the white ones. He tried to get all white cows and he had Chester White Roots house and he raised a lot of pigs and took up to the fairs and uh, after I graduated from eighth grade then I more or less took care of the farm and even though he had a new tractor uh, I did the plowing with the horses I learned that at a very young age and uh, in the old house, in, in the winter time, we would uh, take the horse harnesses apart and wash them all up and then um, put them in oil to soak up, to keep the leather nice and soft. And he'd also, he made several different tools in uh, in the old house, he had a stove in there. I know we always liked to play in there, and uh, <clears throat> he had all his carpenter tools in his tool chest, which he thought it was locked, but uh, <laughs> we knew where the key was. So when he wasn't around, we'd always go in the box, and there it's, that's where the better tools were in. But he always had some laying on the tool bench, you know, that we were using. But we always liked uh, the sharper ones. <laughs> yeah, he made uh, a wheelbarrow, complete wheelbarrow, everything except uh, the metal band for the, for around the wheel. He made the spokes all out of wood, and he had built uh, a steam engine for my brother and I for Christmas and uh, well he was kind of running out of time and, uh, the night or day or so before Christmas that's when he first painted it <laughs> oh what else did he make hmm. okay carpentry was his business this was the last house that he built he died in and uh, when he was 72. So uh, the upstairs wasn't all finished yet, but the day before he died, uh, him and I, we were up working upstairs, putting in insulation, and the next morning, he was gone. Uh, and uh, I was born in uh, a log house. It was an old log house. It was so cold in there, and uh, my grandmother, she was over at the house when my when I was to be born. So uh, my mom didn't want to tell her that it's cold in the house because she was afraid that my grandma would uh, fire up the stove and get it too hot. And there was ice on the walls. It was so cold in there. 
And I was born there on uh, 25th of February in 1926. In the winter time, we, we each had an old sled and then we'd uh, fasten a box on top of that sled and then we'd go on back and push it as our car or truck. And uh, in back of the shed uh, was an apple orchard. And then each one was my sister Jenny and my brother Hermie. We each had a certain tree where we lived. And then, then we'd go through the, the whole motion in the morning. You get up and do your chores, and then you got to haul your milk to the cheese factory. A certain tree was the cheese factory, and a certain tree was the, the mill. A certain tree was the store. And then we'd make uh, a track through the snow for our roads and our driveways. And uh, then we'd say, well, I'm going to haul the milk to the cheese factory. And then... Uh, we all had to do that. And then in the summertime, we each built a little farm. We'd take two bricks and then lay a board across, and that, that's your house. And then in the barn, you had two bricks, put board on. That was the basement of the barn. Then you put two bricks on top of the board, and you put some more boards on that. That was your, your hay loft. And then another board on top for your roof. And then we would um, build roads. We'd take uh, a lat, which was about an inch uh, wide, and we'd make little stakes and, and set up forms. And then we'd make uh, mud, uh, ground and water, and uh, make, make our roads. And then we also, you know, do all our work. You know, we had uh, little train cars for our cars. And uh, we'd go and pull grass to make hay. <clears throat> and some of it we let dry for dry hay in the barn. And we'd take a, si uh, a tile for a silo. Then we'd fill silo, you know, pull grass with our hands and stuff it in the, in the silos. And uh, we'd have a great time. Of course, there was also work to be done. My dad had 12 cows, so the three of us each had four cows. And uh, we had to clean out the barn. So Jenny, being the, the eldest of us, she, she could use the wheelbarrow first to clean out her cows, but she could only use one load and then I would get a chance and I, I could make a load and then my brother would get a chance and uh, well then you always make dealings I was a little bit stronger than my sister or my brother so when Jenny cleaned out her four cows and uh, she couldn't uh, fill the wheelbarrow full I'll make a deal. If I haul out her load, she can probably get it all on one. And then uh, she'd do something for me in return. And he had, my dad had three horses, and their names were Flory, Kearney, and Birdie. And uh, Jenny's horse was uh, Flory, mine was Kearney. And Hermes was Bertie. And we also each had to clean out one horse. Uh, oh, and about my brothers, uh, when I was uh, six years old in February, then uh, in, in the spring, then I was old enough to go to school, but I wasn't going to start Catholic school until in fall. So there was a public school in, a, in our district, uh, just in Belgium, and uh, so we would walk, walk to that school. It was uh, a mile and a half, my, my sister and I, and then we'd walk down to Jacobi's, 
And then uh, one of their daughters, she was older, and she walked with us. So I went in kindergarten there, and then in fall I started in the Catholic school in Decatur. I started serving when I was in fourth grade. And when I was in sixth grade, I was teaching a class of mass servers. I mean, everything had to be just, just so and genuflect and uh, fold your hands and make a bow and carry the book up and down the stairs. And that, that, that was so neat. And today you don't see that no more. You know who taught me? How to serve Mass? Your Uncle Frank. Yeah, he taught me. So the first time I served Mass with, with your Uncle Frank, good fighter, Pleer, Alfred Pleer, and uh, Sylvester Reese. Yeah, they always, they always had four servers then. Oh, that was neat. Yeah, I like that. And um, I served Mass. Well, for a couple of years I didn't serve Mass when I was working out. Oh, but when I worked by my uncles, that was the year before I got married, then I served Mass on a Sunday. And then when Father Kemmer came, then he says, we want all holy name men to be Mass servers. On, on Holy Name Sunday. I want men up there. And you are in charge. So you don't want to, I don't know if I'm using this word right, befriend nobody. So uh, on, on towards the weekend, you know, I'd call. So I'd have four men that would come and serve mass, like Nick Arndt, Nick Arndt, Tony Steinmetz, Oh, and uh, Dippius and Nick Youngers, all them old timers, they were glad to do that. They went and they bought uh, big cassocks, you know, surplus for the for them to uh, dress up. That was real neat. When I was 18 years old, then I went to work out by, by a neighbor. Alois Schiller. And after that, then I worked uh, by Charlie Beaver, by Port Washington. And after that, I worked by Joe Oberst for a little over two years. And then I went to work for my uncle for a year. And then uh, I met Sally at uh, Weiler's Log Cabin Ballroom in 1945. And uh, what it so happened that uh, I had seen her come to the dance hall with this guy with uh, red hair. And she had beautiful black hair. And I could never figure out how a red-headed guy could have such a nice black-haired girl. But uh, there was nothing I could do about that. So after a while, I had the opportunity to find out who this girl was. Somebody that I knew intro introduced her to me. And uh, I asked her for a dance, and from then on, you know, she was my girl. <laughs> she also came, she came from a family of nine children. They had six girls and three boys. And it uh, took a lot of courage to go to uh, a place like that to pick up a girl. <laughs> uh, when we, we got married on that May 28, 1949. 1949, 1949, yeah. And then in, in, uh, we lived with my, my folks because uh, when we bought this place, there was uh, an older log house here, and uh, unable to fix it up, 
but um, we wanted to move out from under my parents. So in fall, oh, during the summertime, Sally and my mom, they uh, washed off the walls and, uh, and they uh, painted it with uh, calcimine that was like a whitewash. So we had uh, a kitchen and had a bedroom and then there was a small room on the side, which in the summertime when we trashed the grain, we didn't have no granary here. So we boarded up that room. <laughs> we put the grain in that room and upstairs. So uh, when we got married on May 28th, then uh, that was on Saturday and on Monday was uh, Decoration Day or Mem Memorial Day. And then on Tuesday, we came over here, my dad, my brother, and myself. We came over here and we started digging the basement to build the house. And my dad was 69 years old. And when he built this house, and he didn't have no skill saw. He had to saw everything by hand. And uh, my brother had been sick. He had been in a hospital, I think, for about nine weeks. He just happened to come home from the hospital uh, in time for the wedding, because he was the best man for a wedding. And uh, then uh, my mom, she, uh, she always raised a lot of chickens. So in fall of the year, when the, the pullets started laying eggs, then she gave us uh, a flock of her old hens. So then we had chickens over here, and I had raised a couple of pigs uh, for, for brood sows. We had them over here. That was in October. And in October, then we moved over here. And we had nine children, six boys and three girls. And it was a very interesting life. It uh, was kind of rough because we didn't have nothing at all. In fact, the uh, first job that I got on the side to earn some money was uh, I drove milk truck for Artie Russell. I, uh, my check for the month was $78 in some cents. And uh, it was kind of rough going because you don't do much with $78 a month. See, I worked my dad's farm in exchange for labor while he was building our house. So there was no money being exchanged. But uh, he would bring milk along over here so we'd have milk to eat. But then afterwards when we had chickens, we had eggs to eat. And in December we bought uh, five cows and then we could ship milk to the cheese factory and we had our own milk to drink. And then we had credit at the cheese factory. We could buy cheese. So things were getting better then. And in November, Sally's brother, Hank, and I, we went up north for deer hunting. Well, we didn't get a deer, but uh, we stayed at his uncle's place up north. And he got a deer, and he, he gave it to us. So then we had deer meat. Things are getting better now. <laughs> I hauled milk there for two years, and I needed more money because I had bought a chopper. Uh, so then I uh, I went to work for Alfred Antoine, and I got uh, hundred and fifty dollars a month. Of course, I had to work twice as hard, <laughs> but that was okay. And then I, I worked by Antoine for five years, and. Uh, my arms were kind of like shot handling milk cans, so I had to give it up. Then uh, my brother and I, we rented my uncle's farm, so we had a little more land to work, and we did that for a couple of years. And uh, after that, I rented uh, my father-in-law's farm 
for for a year. And uh, well, as time went on, you know, we got more kids, and kids start going to school. And that, that kept on going for years. Uh, then in uh, let's see, what year was that? Uh, oh, 19, oh, right off hand, I don't, oh, 1966, I finally got a job at Boland's in Port Washington, and I had applied several different places trying to get a job, and nobody was hiring, and uh, I had applied there in fall, and Oh, in February, I got a call from Poland's, and he says, we got a job for you. I says, well, that's so long ago that I had applied for a job, I kind of forgot about it. <laughs> and, uh, well, I should come in for an interview. So I went in the next day, and uh, I was hired. And then I worked there for 23 long years. <laughs> That's when I was 62 years old. So then I thought, well, now I'll retire and I can farm in leisure because I like farming. Well, I didn't farm too long and when my health fell apart. So that went on for I had my near syndrome. And it got so bad that I was unable to take care of the cows. So then we had to sell the cows. So we sold the cows and then I was more retired and we rented the land out to our youngest son, Edward. And that's uh, been going on like that ever since. Now I'm 79 years old and I still like farming. I still do mostly all the tractor driving up to now. But uh, the last two years, I told Edward, I said, uh, don't depend on me too much because I don't know how much longer I can do this. But if I'm able to, I will. And uh, right now, I'm anxiously waiting to get out on the land. Your mom, Jeannie, she was a cute little baby. She was about six months old when, uh, after we were done eating supper, that's when she usually would get up. And this one night, she didn't wake up, you know. And I had asked Mom, I says, uh, where's Jeannie? Oh, she's still sleeping yet. So I went in the barn, I started milking, and all of a sudden, one of the kids came running in the barn. I should come in the house. There's something wrong with Jeannie. So I, I came in the house. I said, what's wrong? Well, she stops breathing. Called the doctor. So I called the doctor and uh, they had the phone off the hook. So uh, there was no way how I could get a hold of the doctor. I could hear their dog barking in the house, but I, they won't answer the phone. So I, I said, so we'll run her down there right away. So I got the car out and she brought and uh, well, we went flying down to Belgium right to the doctor's house and uh, I ran to the house and I told the doctor you know, well he says go to the office I'll be right there so I took her to the office and then he checked her over and she had her fever was so high and he said uh, you could take her to the hospital but he said you can take better care of her at home because you will be watching her constantly. If you take her to the hospital, I mean, there ain't going to be nobody sitting there for her. So we brought her home and she put her in a bathinet with water and tried to cool her down and put ice on her forehead. She even had gotten some freezer burn on her forehead. Uh, Mom stayed up most of the night and then I'd be up for a little while and then Mom would be up with her again. 
And by morning, she thought she was a little better. But by the time we were done with chores, then uh, she wasn't so good no more. And I guess the doctor came over to the house that day. And I don't know what else they did for her to get the temperature down. And that was sad. She got over it again, and uh, when she was going to school, I think when they were playing, um, how did that happen? Anyhow, oh, something must have happened to her, to her neck, because she has such a neck brace on for a while. Oh, and one time she had something in her throat. Uh, something to do with her voice box. She had to do something. But uh, she she was a nice she girl. She was good. You could uh, ask her to do anything and, and she would do it. Uh, and <clears throat> later on in years uh, she helped me milk. She was real handy in the barn. <laughs> I remember that uh, no, I, I might get this mixed up with with Patty, it was either Patty or Jean. Uh, when uh, we had the ice storm, well, this could be figured out which one it was. When uh, we were out of electricity, and then Vern Arndt, the photographer for the Ozaki Press, he came out to the farm, and he wanted to uh, take a picture of her milk and milking a cow by hand. <laughs> and then, and then they put that in the paper. And then she got razzed in, in high school, <laughs> you know, pulling the tits. <laughs> oh, and then uh, when she graduated, that was the time when we had our 30th wedding anniversary. And, uh, well, between her and mom, they, uh, they thought we should have a celebration and they put the two together. And, okay. So that morning, Sunday morning, it was so foggy, you, you couldn't see from here to the barn. And I says, boy, you sure picked a nice day. <laughs> see, my mom and Father Nick, they came all the way from, oh, uh, I don't know, it was Mineral Point or somewhere, so far away to drive. <coughs> but we had a nice uh, graduation party a nice anniversary party. Oh, and uh, I came home one day. <laughs> Maybe your mom won't like this. <laughs> Here, her, and, and Sally were sitting underneath the tree. And, and she says, guess what, Dad? What, what? I'm going to get married. <laughs> sure. Yes, that's okay. Yeah, but she says soon. <laughs> oh, no, no, you aren't old enough. Yes, I am. You won't let me get married now. We're going to live together. Oh, <laughs> no, you won't. <laughs> I shouldn't tell you this. <laughs> yes, you should. <laughs> no, well... Then they got they got married. Beautiful wedding. Real nice. We had uh well it was in, in January. So you got a whole bunch of people in your house there. And uh, and uh, the bathroom, you know, only one bathroom. So we come up with an idea, why don't we have it in the church basement? You know, after after the services, go down to the basement. And we had a beautiful party there. Oh, we had a lot of comments on that. That was nice. That was uh, real nice. Yeah. <laughs> I, never, I never got a job for any of our kids. They got their own job. Oh, now I'm getting into Patty's line, though. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, Jean worked at Careers, and 
she she was she was so good at what she was doing that she had a lot of spare time and she made she made her own wedding dress in it yeah. she made her own dress and she'd be working on that once in a while but her window was she could see right out the window when the when her boss was coming you know and she just put everything underneath you know and she'd be working I, I still remember her making that dress. And she bought her material, beautiful material. Now you're gonna have a young lady take such beautiful material and start cutting around on it. Oh, she made, well maybe you've seen the shirt that she made for me for Christmas, that green shirt. Yeah, she made that for my Christmas present. She was really good. Oh, and then uh, I think from careers she went by Peterson, you know? She worked by Peterson. Oh, and from Peterson she went to what, Orthodontus? Yeah. She was really good with uh, bookkeeping and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember Donna telling us. I don't know if she, if she ever told Jean about that or not. <laughs> because they were not supposed, no family. They're not supposed to hire no family. Well, she had hired Jean. But nobody was going to say anything. But word had gotten out the first day she was working there. Maybe you heard about that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how long she worked there before they ever found out, you know, the other girls that were working there, before they ever found out they were sisters. They couldn't believe it because uh, uh, Donna had more blackish hair and, and Jean was more blondish. They did real well. Yeah, and then all of a sudden they had a little girl. They called her Becky. And Mom was working at Careers. She was working at Careers, and uh, so she leave Becky off here. And Becky, Becky was very picky who was going to watch over her. <laughs> and, and she didn't like me. So one morning, mom had to go somewhere. So your mom dropped you off here and uh, put her in a chair there. There you sat. I'm sitting over here. I didn't look at her. <laughs> Just you and me here. <laughs> and we got along real fine. <laughs> uh, we always, everything was Luxembourg. I don't know when we started speaking English, but it must have been later on in years because, uh, like my dad, I remember my dad, uh, when we, we pray before meals, my dad, he would always pray in German. You know, we'd be praying in English and he'd pray in German. And I always, I always wanted to learn that, and I would still like to do that. Now, when I went to work for my uh, aunt and uncles, they all prayed in German. And I worked there a whole year, and you know, I, I, never, I never learned it. Just a number of words, and it just sounds some mumbling, you know. <laughs> What did the doctor say? Ah, my father, my father, they learned a bit of Lisboish. Ah, when I went to the doctor again, and I came home, they said to me, "Well, what did the doctor say?" You know, what did the doctor say? <laughs> no, I, I think. Uh, it would be so interesting for, I don't know, I, I can talk smart, because <laughs> I can talk Luxembourg. But 
if uh, I, I would kind of like to learn German. That would be neat. Now, if I lived with a person, I think I would, I would have interest enough to learn to speak German. But I didn't learn how to pray the Our Father to Hail Mary in German. But I'm going to ask my sis, uh, my sister. She know she can pray that in German. Because she worked by my aunt and uncle for for years from little on. You know. She knows German. Yeah. It, it is. Uh, I think it's so handy. Like now that our new pope, well, he's spoken four different languages, but. Pope John Paul, how many could he speak? Seventeen? Yeah. Yeah? A lot. Oh. Uh, yeah. Well, see, our Luxembourg, uh, well, something interesting happened just two weeks ago. We went to the Sandpiper in Oostburg, uh, a restaurant. Uh, Patty told us there's a guy there that can speak Luxembourg. Oh, I want to meet that guy. So we went for a fish fry there, and I forgot all about it. And we were just walking out, and all of a sudden I thought, oh, where's that guy that can speak Luxembourg? So I stopped and I looked over by the cash register uh, to see if a uh, clerk was there. You know, I was going to ask her. And I don't know how come this happened. The guy is sitting right in the booth right there. So I, I, I still can't figure out how we got together just like that. I couldn't get away from the guy. <laughs> and there, he was sitting at a booth with a couple, and I thought they were his relation. So I'm speaking Luxembourg to him, and I ask him in Luxembourg, are, are those, is that your relation? He says, no. And the deaf people, they're sitting there laughing, you know. And I says, uh, can you understand Luxembourg? No, they, they couldn't understand a word. <laughs> it, was, it was so interesting. And uh, I would find it interesting to, uh, you know, if I'd go to Luxembourg and, and talk to them people, you know, they, they are so happy when somebody else comes that knows speak their language. But we were at a, a Luxembourg doings in Belgium, and there was uh, people from Luxembourg there sitting across the table from us, and I couldn't understand the word they were saying. They have so much French mixed in with their Luxembourgers, and then uh, it's like we use a lot of English words in our Luxembourg too. Like I have a Luxembourg dictionary. And I, I see that uh, when somebody writes in the paper, in the newspaper, you know, from the Luxembourg, well, that's, that's here ain't right. <laughs> it, it, it's getting so hard. There's so few people left that talk Luxembourg. But whenever we get together, Luxembourgers, uh, we speak Luxembourg. But it's getting so hard. Sometimes you didn't speak Luxembourg for for weeks and maybe even longer and not much and then it gets to be a little harder to to speak it you you come upon certain words you know and it's getting to be hard to find somebody uh oh okay i'm 79 uh how many other people do i know that are uh, very, very few people that I know that are in their 80s, although I know some that are in their 90s that, that know Luxembourg. But it's uh, getting hard. So we learned, we learned English, and then I learned Latin, you know, as mass server. And we had all Latin prayers, and I, I can rattle them off today as I did when I first started learning the prayers. Adem quilitificat juventutamem, quita tuus deus meditudum 
ah, martitudo meam, quare me rapilisti et quare tristus in cedo dum affligit me in amicus, miseriata tui omnipotens deus, dimissus peccatus tua spredugate et vita maternum, suscipiat dominus sacrificium de manibus tuus et laudam et gloriam nominus sui at ututulitatem quoque nostrum totiusque et Ecclesiae Sui Sancte. 